All right, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Joel Legia. I'm a grad student at Yale University. My advisor is uh, Peter Van Dockum, and I've done this work in uh, collaboration with Marian Franks at Leiden and uh, Kate Whitaker at NASA Goddard. And uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about how to reconcile the evolution of the stellar mass function uh, with the observed star forming sequence. And specifically, I want to talk about basically uh, what can we learn about the uh, star forming sequence from looking at the evolution of the mass function. Okay. Um, and so basically, uh, the mass function and the star forming sequence both tell us how galaxies build up mass. They're kind of fundamental observables of galaxy evolution. Um, and they're also critical inputs and constraints to models of galaxy evolution. Um, these things are sort of central to uh, you know, main sequence integration, to semi-analytical models, to hydrodynamical simulations, to uh, abundance matching models, and to uh, models that look at uh, galaxy evolution in a constant number density. Um, so these are, these are very important things. Um, and they all tell us stories about how galaxies build up mass. And so it's very important that the uh, stellar mass function and the star forming sequence tell a sort of consistent story. Okay? Um, and so the, the stellar mass function and the star forming sequence, they, they can be used to put powerful constraints on one another. Um, that's because the first order, they're a sort of derivative integral pair. The stellar mass function grows to first order primarily through star formation. And so people have uh, examined this in the past. and. Uh, um, this is a plot from uh, Simona Weinemann's paper in 2012, where she built a sort of very, very simple toy model. And she took the um, stellar mass function at redshift uh, 0.9, it's the dashed line there, and then she grew the stellar mass function with star formation alone, um, no correction for quiescent galaxies, no merging, um, nothing like that. She grew it with the star forming sequence and showed that basically if you compare the uh, um, grown uh, star or the grown stellar mass functions with the observed stellar mass functions at redshift zero, um, you can use this to put constraints on the slope of the star forming sequence. Uh, and this is important because uh, measurements of the slope of the star forming sequence have been anywhere between, um, well, uh, basically a negative one and zero in this parameterization where it's a uh, specific star formation rate. So this is something that we can use to learn about um, sort of the. Uh, the star formation sequence. Okay? Um, but so this was a very simple model, and there's ways that we can prove on it as well. And um, we can also extend this model to higher redshift to see uh, whether it also holds true at high redshift, because uh, there's been a lot of new um, observations that have come out since then. Okay? And so that's what we do here. We take a fresh look at the consistency between the star formation rate sequence and the stellar mass buildup. And so we do this with um, two data sets here. We take the stellar mass function from uh, the Z-Forge survey, um, which also includes uh, Candle's data. This is uh, basically, it's the deepest stellar mass function available right now. Um, it covers uh, between locally all the way out to redshift three. Um, and one of the most interesting things we've learned about it so far is that uh, there's a lot more low mass galaxies at high redshift uh, than people previously knew. Um, and so here it's, uh, we're comparing uh, survey depth limits to some other uh, um, surveys of the mass function. And Z-Forge goes quite a bit deeper at redshift uh, 1 to 1.5, as well as higher. Um, and I also use the uh, star forming sequence uh, measured from uh, Whitaker et al. 2012. uses NMBS data and measures star formation rates. Um, it's a homogeneous UV plus IR star formation rates. Um, and so we use this combination of um, star formation rates and stellar mass, and we model their consistency here. Okay. Um, and so we start out with a very, very simple model. Basically, you take the observed mass function here, and then you grow it with the star formation sequence. You have to extrapolate both the mass function and the star formation sequence to low stellar masses. Um, and then you modulate the uh, growth due to star formation by the fraction of star forming galaxies, um, assuming that quiescent galaxies form no stars here. And there's also a correction for a passive stellar evolution. We, we approximate this as an instantaneous correction. Um, and then what you can do is you can compare the evolution of the mass function as it is observed to the evolution predicted by the star forming sequence. Okay? Um, and so we could do that. Uh, this is a very simple model. I'm going to show it to you right now with no mergers um, starting from redshift uh, 2.25. And so here, this is the black one is the observed, and I'm going to show you a blue one which is grown with the star forming sequence. Right. There we go. Um, and so you could see there's immediate problems here. Um, essentially, the mass function that's grown with the observed star forming sequence blows up. Um, it grows way too quickly. And so uh, this, this star forming sequence extrapolated to low masses, like, it, it can't hold. There must be something wrong here. Um, and so there's three sort of immediate possibilities. 
One is um, there's a very high merger rate here, and all these low-mass galaxies are destroyed by mergers or absorbed into larger galaxies before they can make the mass function blow up like this. Um, it's also possible that uh, you could lower the average growth rate by adding a large number of quiescent galaxies at high redshift. Um, and the third possibility is that, OK, we haven't really observed the star-forming sequence down to this mass limit yet. Maybe extrapolating it doesn't quite work. Maybe it has some sort of different behavior at low masses and high redshifts. Okay, so these are the three uh, possibilities. Um, and we can investigate these. Um, and so what we do here is um, we just uh, go into the uh, Guo et al. 2013 SAM. And we measure the destruction rate of low mass galaxies. And by destruction rate, I mean if it merges with a larger galaxy, we consider it destroyed. Um, and so you can measure this directly from the same analytical model. Uh, the destruction rate is moderate. It's about uh, 8 9% per uh, giga year at redshift 2. And that drops down to about 2 or 3% locally. Okay. You could take this and um, you could apply it to the mass function. And so here we assume uh, this happens in 1 to 10 merger ratios. It actually doesn't matter because um, as you can see, this sort of modest merger rate, it basically has almost no observable effect at the low mass end of the mass function. Um, these, these are two lines. There are two distinct lines. Um, but it's barely even observable on this scale. And so basically, uh, the merger rate isn't, it's not sufficient to sort of reconcile um, the star formation sequence and the stellar mass function here. The merger rate is too low. Okay? So um, merger rate doesn't work. Um, you would have to up the merger rates by about a factor of 100 for that to uh, sort of reconcile the two. Okay? Uh, there's also the possibility that there's an undetected population of quiescent low mass galaxies at high redshift. Um, the Z-forged mass functions are complete. Uh, nominally down to these uh, numbers. So we should see them in the mass functions. Uh, you can assume you didn't. Um, and you would have to miss a factor, you know, the number density of quiescent galaxies would have to increase by about a factor of 1,000 for this to work. Um, and this is, uh, this is something we probably would see at lower redshifts. So we can rule that out as well. The final possibility is that maybe the star forming sequence behaves differently at low mass. Maybe it's not a single power law. Maybe it has to um, get steeper at low mass. And so that's what we sort of test out here. And we postulate a new functional form where it has one slope at high masses, a shallow slope, and then a steeper slope at low masses. And so this retains the observed normalization and the observed slope at high mass. But then what you do is you make it much steeper at low masses. Um, and we can test that out as well. Um, and so this is it in green. And as you can see, it's much more stable. It works much better. Here we use a slope of unity for the um, low mass slope. And so this, this broadly reconciles the evolution of the mass function and the star formation sequence. Rho beta is what? The SFR? Yeah, mass. Uh, that's a good question. So uh, it can be defined in specific star formation rate, um, which would be uh, basically you add 1 to the slope in specific star formation rate to get the relationship between star formation rate and stellar mass. That's what I'm using. Yeah. So B to, B to your B to of 1 is paying it to our B to of 0. Yes. 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 Um, yep. And so uh, the reason this new functional form removes the rapid growth of low mass galaxies is because um, basically if you change the slope, um, you change the uh, mass doubling time here. And it, it's, a, it's a very large factor. Um, if you change the slope from the observed slope, uh, in what occurred all of about 0.44 at redshift 2. You change it to a slope of unity. Um, that's more than an order of magnitude in doubling time we're changing. Okay, so we're drastically changing the growth of low mass galaxies. So since the mergers don't affect it so much, would that imply that your slope needs to be even stronger, perhaps? Uh, the slope? Yeah. Oh, you mean because it still doesn't quite work here. Uh, that's an excellent question. And so um, there's still an offset here. Um, it doesn't quite work. And so uh, there, there's a number of things that we can tweak. We have a number of knobs that we can tweak in order to make this work. And the problem is um, it's hard to tell which one is wrong. You could have errors in star formation rates. You could have errors in stellar masses. And you know, almost certainly we do, because if you compare these things between publications, uh, they often don't agree. Um, you can change the merger rate you know, by factor 3, 4. Um, this is also uh, something that's not well constrained observationally. And also, our uh, model treatment of mass loss isn't perfect. So I'm not going to go into this too much right now. Um, we, we, we delve into this more in the paper. Um, and we uh, try to sort of merge all these things and create a sort of reasonable model. Um, but instead, I'm going to use the last couple of minutes to talk about the implications of having two different slopes to the star forming sequence. Um, so first off, OK, I'm saying there's two slopes. Has this been observed yet? Is this something that people are seeing? Um, the answer is uh, 
Not really, kind of. Um, so as of a couple months ago, this is something that had been hinted at in several studies. Um, but it tends to be somewhere like just around the mass completeness limit. Studies need to just go a little bit deeper to be able to sort of confirm this, say yes or no. Um, and, uh, you know, if this is something that is true, if there are two, indeed two distinct slopes here, um, then one thing that's interesting is that uh, measurements of the star forming sequence have derived all kinds of different slopes. And so this is from a... Uh, I know. <laughs> the error bars are all very small and they're nowhere near each other. Um, <laughs> this is a plot from Spiegel et al. 2014. Basically shows that uh, a lot of people have derived a lot of values for the um, slope in the star forming sequence. And it's sort of unclear um, what it is, you know. Um, so uh, one possibility here is that maybe there's two slopes. What's happening is um, the slope you derive will depend very sensitively on um, basically how deep you go in stellar mass. Uh, the deeper you go, um, the closer to unity it's going to be. Yes, it does. Um, and so that's part of what this uh, plot is showing here. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so th there's a number of dependencies. This would be one among many. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, uh, but anyway, so uh, there hadn't been any observations till recently, but uh, then in a companion paper, um, Kay Whitaker uh, used uh, candles in 3D HST data to actually go out and explicitly measure this. Um, and she split galaxies uh, at a mass of about 10.2, and she asked, well, what is the slope? Um, and is it different? And it turns out uh, this is what she found. Um, the slope at low masses appears to be close to unity. Um, and the slope at high masses is flatter, and it also evolves with redshift. Okay, so this is something that um, has been sort of predicted phenomenologically. And also, if you go out and look at real galaxies, it turns out it just might be true. Yeah? Um, and uh, so sort of the last question is, uh, how does it work in theoretical models? You know, I've said um, you need this sort of two-part power slope or uh, power law in order to reproduce the evolution of the mass function. Um, so this must be in place if you reproduce the evolution of the mass function. Um, and it turns out if you plot um, these uh, relationships between star formation rate and mass, you take them from uh, hydro models, um, from uh, abundance matching models, you know, from semi-analytical models, you actually do get this sort of difference in slope at the high mass end, the low mass end. Okay? Um, and people have argued in the past that this difference in slope is something that might be a problem with the models. Maybe it's uh, coupling the star formation rate too closely to the specific dark matter accretion rate. Um, but uh, our work sort of suggests that uh, if you actually want to reproduce the evolution of the mass function, um, a mass-dependent slope is a critical component of uh, a any theoretical model trying to do that. So um, oh, that's the end. I'll leave up my conclusions. You may have seen uh, in June that we had a paper paying attention. Yes. We looked at all this analytically. Yes. With a rather different approach, but just very briefly, if I may sort of summarize that. What we basically did was took as an ansatz that the faint end slope of the star forming mass function was observed Beta was indeed a, a, a constant, and then we looked at how much merging we had to have in order to keep alpha constant given that beta. And the summary of that was that the beta, our beta of minus 0.1, which is I think your beta of 0.9, we could do that if the specific, like we parameterized merging as the specific mass increase rate due to merging be compared with the star formation rate increasing mass. If that was about a tenth of the SSFR, then we could actually keep alpha exactly constant with a beta of minus 0.1. Mm -hmm. If beta gets to about minus 0.4, it becomes indeed completely impossible. But that tenth between the, S uh, the specific uh, merger mass rate and the specific star formation rate fits, as far as we can see, extremely well with the sort of observed uh, estimates of, of merger rate. Mm -hmm. So we, we concluded from that that merging worked extremely well and that you know, that was enough and in fact this sort of merging you see in the sky would have this effect of keeping the faint end slope uh, nice and constant. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and so they're consistent, I think, the two works. Um, just because um, you, you guys chose a beta of um, uh, negative 0.1. Uh, and, and so, yeah, uh, you, you, can, uh, you can have merging reconcile it uh, if you already have a steep relationship between stellar mass and uh, stellar formation rate. Yeah, um, that's definitely true. Uh, I, I guess the question is uh, whether or not you uh, take seriously sort of the uh, um, less steep slopes, the slopes of, um, in, in my parlance, you know, 0.6 or so. And so uh, there, there's definitely um, some scatter in the observations. Yeah, and this may be one possibility, one way to get around that. Did you have another question? Uh, yeah, about where to change the slope. Would it be possible to change the slope at 10 to the 5 in stellar mass, to 2 in stellar mass, and you will get... I could well imagine that from a boundless matching perspective, you have a very many objects that would match this very low stellar mass. Um, yeah, uh, uh, well, um, there's certainly a transition somewhere between 10 to the 9.5 and 10 to the 10.5, um, but our model actually isn't particularly uh, sensitive to the transition mass, so um, we just chose 10.5 and moved on with it. Um, Kate Whitaker uh, found it was um, closer to 10.2, and uh, you know, it's unclear where exactly the transition mass is, but actually th this kind of model isn't particularly sensitive to where the transition mass is. So th that's not a, um, you know, th that number is not something I think uh, we, can, we can approach with this sort of uh, phenomenology. I kind of disagree, I think it would be around L star, but we could talk about that. Yeah, well, may maybe it's, uh, I mean, I think um, there are other things that we're neglecting in this analysis as well, like... Uh, Yes. Where you're at the exponential cutoff, it's exponentially cutting off, and so you, you lose much sensitivity to the slope of the Yes, I agree. Oh, uh, Sandy. So there's a long standing problem with little galaxies uh, that they, it, it, unless you do something, as the gas falls in, they make too many stars early. And so semi-analytic modelers are looking for solutions to this, putting the gas in some sort of inert uh, reservoir, which I, I call the parking lot, then to be available for star formation later. Mm -hmm. is, is that problem really this problem? Um. I'm not sure. I'd have to think about that for a while. Um, they're trying to slow down star formation? They're basically trying to slow down star formation, but then recapture gas later. Yeah, so in this picture, um, the models sort of uh, have a um, lower star formation rate than the uh, extrapolated high mass uh, um, star forming sequence would predict. Um, so I, I, I think those might be different problems, but I'm, I'm not sure. It's a good question. Uh, well, the net result is either way, at low masses, you're forming less stars at early time, fewer stars at early time. So mm -hmm. I would say that they must have some elements in common, mm -hmm. even if they aren't exactly the same. Well, this is kind of getting observations to match observations. You've got one set of observations, and the problem is they didn't match the other set of observations. It's differential right. mass growth. As soon as you don't have constant SSFR, you don't have constant mass doubling time, you will get then you change the slope. that, and it's yes. yes. really fast. What does the local observation tell us? It uh, must have this uh, motion much further than the uh, high branches. Yeah. The lowest <laughs> uh, you would have liked to think so, David. No. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't see it. I was looking for the Z0 when extrapolated. Uh, yeah, so um, the uh, yeah, it's not quite all the way down to redshift zero. There are some, uh, there's still some wiggle room, I think, even in local studies. So um, at the very end of this plot, you could see uh, measurements in this compilation have ranged from a slope of 0 0.3, 0 0.4 to one. Um, you know, I, I think uh, on average, most studies tend to find around 0 0.7, 0 0.8, um, but uh, there there is very large variance, um, even locally, unfortunately. Then what do you do with 
there's a number of definitional issues here, like what is a quenched galaxy, and um, do they in, are they included in the star forming main sequence? And also, there's a difference between uh, what kind of indicator you use, um, UV, FIR, um, all, all these things will give different answers. Kate Whitaker's extrapolated slope is uh, 0.7 locally at ratio zero. Yeah. Okay. So, um, thank you, Joel.